So moving on to the second part of the lecture. We are now going to talk about the civil rights of the patients. The patients have the right to the least restrictive means of treatment. So this means that if a patient can be um, treated on an outpatient, then that would be better than admitting the patient as long as it can meet the requisite clinical effect. Patients also have the right to receive visitors and to do so at reasonable hours. Allowance must be made for the possibility that sometimes the patient's clinical condition may not permit, it, permit visit. So for example, um, if the patient is very agitated or suicidal or if the visitor would trigger the patient, um, but in those situations, this should be documented clearly. So a patient's attorney, another private physician of the patient, and members of the clergy should have unrestricted access to the patient and the right to privacy in their discussions. Of course, if there is an emergency, these, um, these visits may be delayed. Of course, you have to think first of the patient's needs. In general, patients should have free and open communication with the outside world, like, for example, telephone or mail. And patients should be allowed private telephone calls, and their incoming and outgoing mail should not be opened by the hospital staff. Of course, this would still depend on specific situations. Patients also have the right to privacy, such as having um, a bathroom and shower time that is private and having a secure storage space for their clothing and their other belongings and they should have adequate floor space per person and have the right ideally to wear their own clothes and to carry their own money. Speaking of money, patients should be permitted to manage their own finances. The exception to this is, of course, if the patient is still incompetent to manage his own finances. And patients should get paid if they work in the institution, such as when they are gardening or preparing food. And this um, is to ensure that the work that they are doing is for a therapeutic need for activity and not exploitative labor work. Let's move on to seclusion and restraints. So for the indications, I will be asking a reporter to explain what are the indications for seclusion and restraint in his or her own words. Basically, these are your indications for seclusion and restraint. To prevent harm to the patient, to prevent significant disruption to treatment program or to uh, prevent also disruption to the physical surroundings, to assist in the treatment of the patient as part of ongoing behavior therapy, to decrease sensory overstimulation, this is applicable only for seclusion, not for restraint, and also at the patient's voluntary reasonable request. I will also be asking someone to elaborate on the contraindications for seclusion and restraint. And these are the contraindications for seclusion and restraints. If the patient has an extremely unstable medical and psychiatric condition, if the patient is delirious or demented, or the patient is unable to tolerate decreased simulation, for patients who are overtly suicidal, for patients with severe drug reactions or overdoses who require close monitoring of drug dosages. So, of course, these contraindications um, uh, does not mean that you will not seclude or restrain the patient. It can still be done, but only if it, there is close supervision and direct 
observation. And it should never be done just for punishment or convenience of the staff. I will be also asking for a reporter to um, elaborate on the restrictions for seclusion and restraint. So restraints and seclusions can be implemented only when the patient creates a risk of harm to themselves or to others and there is no less restrictive alternative. And the restraint and seclusion can only be implemented if there is a written order from a medical official. Orders should be specific and should have time-limited periods, so it should not be as needed. A patient's condition must be regularly reviewed and it should be documented. So if there is an extension of the original order, it must be reviewed and reauthorized. So, there are specific things that should be included in your informed consent. And to better remember this, you can use the mnemonics DTCAP. So, you can rem uh, try to think of Delirium Tremens Community Acquired Pneumonia, DTCAP. So D stands for diagnosis, so there should be a description of the condition or problem. T stands for treatment, so you have to explain the nature and the purpose of the proposed treatment. C, you have to explain what are the risks as well as the benefits of the proposed treatment or its consequences. A stands for alternatives, so you have to also inform the patient of viable alternatives to the treatment, including the risks and benefits of those alternatives. And finally, P stands for prognosis or what is your projected outcome with or without treatment. In regards to uh, the informed consent for minors, the parent or the guardian is usually empowered to give consent to medical treatment. However, there are specific conditions wherein the minor can consent by himself or herself, such as in venereal diseases, in pregnancy, in substance dependence, in alcohol abuse, and in contagious diseases. And of course, if it is also an emergency, the physician can treat the minor without parental consent. So, with regards to the consent forms, there's, there are basic elements to follow. First, you have to have an explanation of the procedure with the, and also it should include the purpose of those procedures so a blanket procedure is not um, really valid because you have to have also identification of the specific procedures and also whether those procedures are experimental. You also have to have description of any possible discomforts and risks that can be expected with that procedure, description of any benefits that are reasonably expected, and disclosure of any appropriate alternative procedures that could be advantageous for your patient. The consent form should also include an offer to answer any questions that the patient may have regarding the procedure and there should also be instruction that the patient can withdraw his or her consent and to discontinue participation if he or she wants to. And some theorists have suggested that the form can be replaced by just a standardized discussion that covers all of the issues noted and that it should be noted in the progress notes. With regards to child custody, the maxim reflects that a natural parent does not inherently have the right to be named as the custodial parent. As a rule, the court presumes that the welfare of a child in his or her tender years is generally best served by maternal custody. But that is only if the mother is a good 
and fit parent. Next, we move on to testamentary and contractual capacity and competence. So there are three psychological abilities that need to be pro proven so that you can say that a person is competent to make a will. And these are, the patient must know the nature and the extent of their property or their bounty. The patient must know that he or she is making a bequest or is handing over his or her property. And the person must know the identities of whoever is the natural beneficiary. So that means the spouse, the children, and other relatives. So sometimes there are witnesses at the signing of a will. So sometimes that includes a psychiatrist. They can attest that the one who was making the will was rational at the time that the will was executed. So if the competence of the person making the will is being questioned, there can be an incompetence proceeding and the appointment of a guardian may be considered necessary. For So for example, if a family member is spending all of the family's assets or the property is in danger of dissipation or like in patients who are elderly, they may have cognitive disabilities or they may be dependent on alcohol or they may be psychotic at the time that they sign the will. So competence is determined on the basis of the ability of the person to make a sound judgment, to weigh, to reason, and to make reasonable decisions. You have to remember that competence is task-specific, not general. Meaning, if um, a person is competent in one thing, he or she may not be competent on another thing. So physicians, especially us psychiatrists, are often asked to give opinions on competence in court. But it's only the judge's ruling which converts that opinion into a finding. So um, to make it official, it's only the judge who can say that that person is competent or not. So you have to remember that just having a mental disorder does not necessarily uh, mean that that person is incompetent. Being admitted to a mental hospital does not necessarily mean that a person is incompetent. It really depends on the situation. Because, this is very important, because when persons have been declared incompetent, they are deprived of certain rights, such as they cannot participate in contracts, they cannot marry, they cannot start a divorce action or drive or handle their own properties or practice their professions, depending on what uh, they were declared to be incompetent at. So, of course, competence is also essential in contracts, such as marriage contracts. With regards to durable power of attorney, this permits persons to make provisions for their own anticipated loss of decision-making capacity. So, for example, a patient with dementia who is still lucid at the time um, and then he or she decides that um, if, if and when later on he or she is incapable of making a decision for himself or herself, he or she is um, selecting a substitute decision maker on his or her behalf. So, um, forensic psychiatry is also very much involved in criminal law. So, we are often asked to um, give our expert opinion on the competence to stand trial of a certain person. So, 
the competence to stand trial is to ascertain whether someone is has sufficient present ability to consult with his or her lawyer with a reasonable degree of rational understanding and whether that person has a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings against him or her. So one of the tools that you can use to assess whether a person is uh, competent to stand trial or fit to stand trial is the Competency Assessment Instrument or the CAI. This structured interview can last around one hour and it can it could should cover 13 functions relevant to competent functioning at trial. So there's no cutoff, uh, specific cutoff, but usually if the score of the patient is three or less, that is a cause, cause for concern. So out of like those 13 functions, the patient cannot uh, do more than three, that would make you think that maybe this patient is not um, fit to stand trial. So these are the 13 functions, the ability to understand the legal defenses available, the level of the unmanageable behavior of the patient, the quality of the patient to relate to his or her attorney, the ability of the patient to plan legal strategy, the ability of the patient to appraise the roles of various participants in the courtroom procedures. So does he or she know what a defendant is, what a lawyer is, what a judge is, etc. The understanding of the court procedures, what is he or she supposed to do once in court, etc., etc. Um, appreciation of the charges, of course, so that does that person understand what the charge means and appreciating what are the possible penalties to that charge and what is the likely outcome of the proceedings and does that person have the capacity to disclose to his or her attorney any pertinent facts surrounding the offense and does that person have the ability to challenge the prosecution witness realistically so if uh, that witness is saying something that is either untrue or incorrect can that can the defendant uh, speak and um, challenge that um, statement, for example, no? And is that person able to testify relevantly for himself or herself? And um, is there self-serving versus self-defeating motivation? So another thing that sometimes um, doctors are asked to be, to comment on or to give their expert opinion on is on the competence to be executed. And this is based on three general principles. A person's awareness that he or she will be executed or, or is um, going to undergo the death penalty. And... Is that person able to make whatever peace is appropriate with his or her belie religious beliefs, including confession and absolution? And does that person preserve the possibility of recalling a forgotten detail of the event or the crime that can exonerate him or her from the death penalty? But, of course, most medical bodies including um, the uh, APA and the AMA, um, have gravitated toward the position that it is unethical for any clinician to participate even remotely in executions. So um, just um, testifying on the competence to be executed can be uh, considered as unethical on that basis since you are still uh, a participant to the possibility of execution. 
So you have to remember that a physician's duty to preserve life transcends all other competing requirements. Next, with regards to criminal responsibility. So according to criminal law, just committing an act that is socially harmful is not the only criteria of whether a crime has been committed. You have to have two components. First, actus reus or voluntary conduct. So you did it voluntarily. And mens rea or evil intent. You really had an intention to do the crime. So for the McNaughton rule, um, I'm going to task another reporter to explain the story of this person who is Daniel McNaughton and how he came about um, murdering um, Drummond, who was actually uh, the assistant, if I'm not mistaken, of Robert Peel, who was the one he actually planned on murdering. But I will leave the details to the reporter. So, um, related to that is the irresistible impulse. This is the rule that a person charged with a criminal offense is not responsible for an act if the act was committed under an impulse that the person was unable to resist because of mental illness. So, it's similar, uh, another name for it is the policeman at the elbow law. Because, like, even if a policeman was at the accused's elbow, he or she would have still done the act. So, the Durham rule, on the other hand, states that an accused is not criminally responsible if his or her unlawful act was the product of mental disease or mental defect. So, the problem with this rule is that it has uh, very vague terms. There were confusions over the terms product, disease, and defect. So, it's very hard to implement if you have some um, confusions over those terms. So, in the end, they just discarded this rule. And instead, what is more followed now is the model penal code. Um, this states that persons are not responsible for criminal conduct if at the time of the conduct, as a result of mental disease or defect, they lack substantial capacity to appreciate the criminality so they know that it was wrong of their conduct and also to conform their conduct to the requirement of the law. So, this um, this particular uh, rule does not include repeated criminal or antisocial conduct. So, it is not in itself a mental disease or defect. So, this is uh, included so that the sociopaths or the psychopaths would not be safe under this uh, particular law. So, with regards to the insanity plea, there are four possible outcomes. So, for the others, it's uh, very much straightforward. Uh, not guilty, not guilty by reason of insanity, and guilty. But, merong problem with regards to guilty but mentally ill. Kasi, ang guilty but mentally ill is actually an alternative verdict, pero wala naman siyang difference. Kasi, that person still uh, has to serve the sentence. Kasi guilty pa rin naman siya. But, so bakit meron pa tayong guilty but mentally ill? Ang mangyayari lang is that for those who are guilty but mentally ill, um, the convicted person should receive psychiatric treatment if necessary. But, this is available din naman or this can be applied din naman to all prisoners. So now we move on to other areas of forensic psychiatry.
for psychological and emotional damage such as in witnessing a stressful act or suffering in um, a specific act because of specific act such as for example yung those who experienced concentration camps um, we are often asked to testify and to examine patients um, to comment on whether there was emotional damage and distress. Next, recovered memories is actually a very delicate area in psychotherapy. So some patients, uh, while undergoing psychotherapy, they may remember memories of abuse from parents or other alleged perpetrators. But um, the problem with that is sometimes um, those victimizers would sue their therapists who they claim negligently induced false memories of sexual abuse because that can happen. So that's why um, it's very important for the therapist to remain neutral, not to suggest, not to persuade or coerce or implant, even um, without meaning to, false memories of childhood sexual abuse. So neutrality is very, very important. Um, another um, area in forensic psychiatry where we are involved in is workers' compensation. So like, for example, if a specific work or employment caused or accentuated a mental illness and the patient is entitled to be compensated for that uh, job-related disability or to receive disability retirement benefits, and we are also asked to evaluate in those situations. And that's the end of this presentation. Um, please prepare for a quiz. And for the reporters, also please prepare for um, your reports. Thank you.